It's 4 p.m. on Thursday, September 4th here in Korea, live from Seoul. I'm Na Hyun Gyeong. Ukraine's Prime Minister responds to Russian President Vladimir Putin's proposal for holding an agreed ceasefire in eastern Ukraine, and it's not positive. He says it's part of Moscow's plan to deceive the West ahead of the NATO summit. Our Son Jung-in starts us off. Following a phone call with Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko on Wednesday, Russian President Vladimir Putin unveiled a seven-point ceasefire plan to end the bloody conflict in eastern Ukraine. Stating his views on the conflict were very similar to those of Poroshenko, Putin said the plan included a halt to separatist fire, a pullback of Ukrainian forces, an end to airstrikes, and the establishment of a humanitarian aid passage. Poroshenko, for his part, said he and Putin shared a mutual understanding on steps to ensure peace in the region, adding that he expected a substantive dialogue on reconciliation to take place during talks in Minsk on Friday. However, Ukrainian Prime Minister Arseniy Yasenyuk dismissed the ceasefire plan, saying it was an attempt to deceive the West about Moscow's real intentions. With growing skepticism, France has also expressed its disapproval by delaying the delivery of two Navy assault ships to Russia. The UN says more than one million people have been uprooted from their homes and many more may follow, as it doesn't look like the dark clouds of war will lift anytime soon. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Degrade and destroy, that's the term President Barack Obama uses to describe how the U.S. plans to deal with Islamic State militants following the brutal killing of two Americans by the group. Obama's pledge was echoed by Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel. Here's Hwang Sung-hee with more. So the bottom line is this. Uh, our objective is clear and that is to degrade and destroy ISIL so that it's no longer a threat, not just to Iraq, but also to the region and to the United States. Following U.S. President Barack Obama's pledge to destroy Islamic State on Wednesday, Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel outlined the dangers posed by the terror group. In an interview with CNN, Hagel called IS something we have never seen before and added his job as Secretary of Defense is not to second-guess what may be or what's going to be. Pointing out that Islamic State controls half of Iraq and Syria today, the U.S. defense chief said Washington will do everything possible to destroy the group's capacity to inflict harm on the American people and values. Earlier this week, President Obama said he would send 350 additional troops to Iraq to protect U.S. interests in Baghdad and in the north of the country, after another American journalist was killed by Islamic State. While a fresh battle against the extremists seems inevitable, Pentagon officials estimate the weapons, fuel and other expenses are costing the U.S. around $225 million a month. And that could be a difficult challenge for President Obama, who now has to reverse one of the key tenets of his two presidential campaigns, that money once spent on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan would be redirected to nation-building at home. Hwang sang Arirang News. And moving on to the latest on the Ebola outbreak, a 29-year-old British nurse has been declared Ebola-free after receiving 10 days of intensive treatment at the Royal Free Hospital in London. William Pooley, who had been given the ex experimental drug ZMAP, was discharged on Wednesday and said he considered himself fortunate, adding that the standard of care he received was a world apart from what his friends were getting in West Africa. Now this, as the death toll exceeded 1,900, extended to a fifth West African country of Senegal. That's more fatalities than all the outbreaks combined since 1976 when the virus was first detected. The World Health Organization also says it's observing a second cluster of Ebola patients in Nigeria's oil country, where as many as 200 people could be at risk. As announced earlier in the year, CVS, the second largest drugstore chain in the U.S., has taken cigarettes off its shelves. The company said in February that it would stop selling goods that conflicted with its health care mission, and it followed through by ditching tobacco products, 
three weeks ahead of schedule. CVS has more than 7,500 retail locations across the U.S. It said its corporate name will be changed to CVS Health and offer programs to help people quit smoking. And helping people quit smoking is something that the Korean government also has in mind. They've announced a plan to hike up cigarette prices here in the nation as they are noticeably low compared to other countries. Our Shin Se-min has this report. The average cost for a pack of cigarettes in Korea currently stands at around $2.50, the lowest in the OECD. But smokers could soon find themselves paying around $2 more. The government and ruling Taenuri Party have come to an agreement on raising cigarette prices in a bid to reduce the nation's current smoking rate of 37.6 percent to 29 percent by the year 2020. The price hike would narrow the gap between Korea and the OECD average, which is $6.40. The low cost of cigarettes in Korea has been blamed on Korea's high smoking rate, which is the second highest among the 34 OECD member nations behind only Greece. Making them more expensive, experts say, will have an effect particularly on younger Koreans who are not economically independent. A quarter of high school students admit to having used tobacco at least once in their lives. Studies show that raising the price of cigarettes also has an effect on people who are economically independent. The consensus among global researchers is that a 10 percent increase in the price of cigarettes results in a 3 to 5 percent reduction in the smoking rate. When the Korean government instituted a price hike of around 50 cents for a pack of cigarettes in 2004, the smoking rate dropped by 14 percent. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The latest data underlined the need for urgent steps to raise household income. This as the Korean government plans on boosting consumer spending in order to break out of its low growth trap. Our Song ji Sun has this report. Despite the need to boost domestic demand, Korean consumers are not earning enough to increase spending as the corporate sector is sucking up an increasingly large share of the wealth generated by the country. Although it's a global trend that households face an uphill battle against corporations in terms of their proportion of a national income, the gap between the two sectors is widening much faster in Korea, according to data released on Thursday by the National Assembly's budget office. Households accounted for just over 62 percent of Korea's gross national income in 2012, down more than eight percentage points from 1995. That pace of loss is twice as fast as the OECD average. On the other hand, Korea's corporate sector increased its share of GNI by nearly 7 percentage points over the same period, four times higher than the OECD average. The parliamentary office attributed the fast decrease in the Korean household share to poor performances by individually run businesses and dwindling interest income. Bank of Korea figures show that households' net interest earnings fell more than 75 percent to $4 billion over the last decade, when the corporate sector shed its interest burden by about 55 percent. To help increase the share of household income, the government is drawing up a package of measures that include revisions to the tax law, but some experts say encouraging investment should also be part of the plan. To facilitate domestic spending, policies that encourage hiring or wage hikes should be promoted so that households actually gain disposable income. The Park Geun administration has emphasized that boosting domestic demand is at the heart of its policies to revitalize the economy. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. 
And adding to negative indicators, the Korean economy grew at its slowest pace in nearly two years in the second quarter. The Bank of Korea confirmed Thursday that the economy expanded just half a percent in the April to June period on quarter in real terms, a shade lower than a 0.6 percent growth estimated in July. It compares with a 0.9 percent gain in the first quarter. The central bank points to lower than expected net exports as one of the major reasons for the sluggish growth. With this, experts say this year's overall growth outlook of 3.8 percent might have to be revised down. And Korean automakers may have been more than happy to turn the calendar over to the month of September this week as both auto production and export figures dropped significantly in August due to labor strikes at Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors and a reduction in the number of working days. The trade ministry says total vehicle output fell by more than 20 percent on year last month. Exports slid by nearly 19 percent to about 183,000 units, while domestic sales inched down 4 percent. Auto imports, however, went the other direction with sales growing over 17 percent on year, the 11th consecutive month of a double-digit increase. And citing recent economic indicators, Korea's finance minister warned last week that the nation had entered the early stages of deflation. But as our Hwang Ji-hae reports, many experts seem to disagree, saying the economy could be doing better and will not face deflationary danger anytime soon. Korea's inflation rate has remained below the 2 percent level for nearly two years. The latest consumer price index has also pointed to a slowdown from a recent pickup. The index rose at its slowest pace in four months, rising 1.4 percent in August from a year ago. That also falls far below the central bank's inflation target band of 2.5 to 3.5 percent. But many experts say the domestic economy running a low inflation rate does not mean it's headed for deflation. When we say deflation, it means a minus inflation rate is continuing for such a prolonged period of time that people's expected inflation rate also turns to minus. So it's too early to talk about deflation. They add that the focus should be on the nation's core inflation rate, which excludes volatile food and energy prices, and that index actually grew at the fastest pace in two and a half years last month at 2.4 percent. Experts say Finance Minister Choi Kyung-hwan had political reasons for raising concerns about deflation. There is a lot of fiscal policy that the government wants to uh, engage in. For example, changes in the welfare policy, uh, measures to uh, try to invigorate some new industries. But that's all being uh, held in status at the National Assembly. So I think this was his way to try to shock the National Assembly into moving on some of these uh, issues. Che's comments also pressured the Bank of Korea to further lower its key interest rate with this month's monetary policy meeting just around the corner. But as concerns linger over the nation's mounting household debt problem, experts say it's likely the central bank will hold off a rate cut this month. The bank lowered the key rate to 2.25 percent in August, the first rate cut since May last year. Hwang Ji, Arirang News. More than 200 energy experts from Korea and around the world have gathered in Seoul to discuss new investment opportunities in the renewable energy sector. President Park Geun-hye was also in attendance as they discussed problems brought on by global climate change. The Korean government has said it would use today's discussions to generate investment opportunities in the areas of electric vehicles, renewable energy and energy storage systems. In line with what she said yesterday, President Park once again stressed the need to remove regulations that hold the private sector back from participating in the markets and expanding globally. Samsung has unveiled four new handset models, including the Galaxy Note 4 in Berlin. The initial reactions seem to be positive, but Apple is looming with an event of its own scheduled for next week. Our Park ji has more. Samsung Electronics has pulled the curtain back on four new models, including its new flagship, the Galaxy Note 4. 
It comes with a 5.7-inch Super AMOLED display and a 16-megapixel camera with an optical image stabilization function. And unlike its predecessor, the Galaxy Note 3, the new version features a sleek metal frame design. The Galaxy Note 4 will continue to set industry standard for how smartphones should help our lives become more enriched, more enjoyable, and more efficient. Another new phone, the Galaxy Note Edge, is also catching the attention of industry insiders, namely for having a display screen that extends to the right edge of the phone, which can be used to show a scrollable panel of information. For me, the most um, curious thing is Galaxy Edge because I heard some rumors, but it was years ago. It was the most, um, 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 the best uh, device for me. Samsung also unveiled a virtual reality headset and its new Gear S smartwatch model in Berlin. The releases come one week before Apple is expected to show off its iPhone 6 to the world. The speculation is that it will have a larger screen, similar in size to Samsung phones, and maintain the two rivals' heated competition in the global market. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Now, but raining on Samsung's parade a bit was news that the company has been ordered to cough up more than 35 million euros or roughly 46 million U.S. dollars in fines to the European Union for the alleged price fixing of microcard chips used in mobile phones. An investigation into three companies, including Samsung and Philips, began in 2008, and the European Commission says they colluded between 2003 and 2005. Samsung's fine has been reduced by 30 percent for cooperating with the investigators. Meanwhile, Philips plans to appeal, saying they firmly believe the claims are unfounded. And shifting gears, talk to any foreigner who has lived in Korea for any extended period of time and they will tell you that shopping online can be a complicated and frustrating ordeal. But relief is on the way as the government is working toward changes that would simplify the process. Our Yurian has this story. In 2008, the personal information of about 10 million people is leaked from an online shopping mall. Another 20 million customers fall victim in 2009 and 2010 when a total of 25 online shopping malls are hacked into. And since Koreans are required to provide their social security numbers, birth dates and other personal info to sign up for a membership, all of it is exposed. Foreigners don't have the same problem because they don't have Korean social security numbers, but that presents another issue for them, as they're unable to shop online without such a number. To combat data leaks and increase the accessibility to online shopping malls for foreigners, the government has decided to do away with a number of measures by the first half of next year. Providing social security numbers will no longer be a requirement for Koreans when making purchases online, and foreigners will be able to purchase goods by verifying their identity through credit cards. We are going to devise new regulations for core growth areas like e-commerce. To do so, we are going to set up a panel of people from different fields of expertise. By breaking down the barriers to online shopping for foreigners, the government expects exports in the sector to increase to 300 billion U.S. dollars by 2017, up from about 24 million last year. Yurian, I didn't news. Bringing you the fresh updates from stories breaking in Korea and abroad. We give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Join Na Hyung Gang live from Seoul every weekday only on Arirang.
Seoul and Washington will establish a combined division of their troops next year with the task of carrying out wartime operations. South Korea's defense ministry says if formed, the unit would be a first of its kind around the world. It will be set up in the first half of next year and be headed by a major general level U.S. officer. Details on the new unit's missions are not available, but officials say at wartime it would be tasked with carrying out special operations such as eliminating weapons of mass destruction and civil missions against North Korea. The ministry expects the new joint division to improve the Allies' deterrence posture and boost their military capabilities to carry out joint operations. The U.S. has confiscated assets from the family of former South Korean President Chun doo Han. The U.S. Justice Department says it seized $500,000 that Chun's daughter-in-law had invested in a company in Pennsylvania. In a statement Wednesday, the assistant attorney in the case said the former president had received some $200 million in bribes from Korean companies while in office and had laundered his ill-gotten gains in Korea and the U.S. In February, U.S. authorities seized more than $700,000 from the former president's second son following a house sale in California. Now, Chun Doo-hun presidency, which lasted for eight years in the 1980s, was tarnished by a great number of corruption scandals. And ending on a lighter note, what we are about to show you is not just a pair of legs, but it's a robot with a name. It's a Kires, or the Actively Coordinated High Speed Image Processing Experiment System. That's one of the fastest bipedal robot robots in the world. Created by roboticists at the University of Tokyo's Ishikawa Watanabe Laboratory, its 14 centimeter long gams can dash up to 4.3 kilometers per hour, or about six steps per second. Now, it can even perform a somersault and also features a high-speed camera and a stabilizing motor that allows it to lean forward uh, without tipping over. The Korean DMZ is a popular spot for tourists who want a glimpse across the border at the north. It's an area fraught with an emotional history, but as our Im Hyun Hee reports, where there are emotions, there is the potential for art. An area of Korea littered with remnants of the Korean War. On the fringe of the 38th parallel north, you wouldn't expect to find much at the Korean demilitarized zone except for maybe skeletons of the destruction that divided a nation. So what would a collection of art be doing in an area like this? Argentinian artist Adrian Villa Rojas shows that the Korean DMZ is in fact a fitting place for artistic inspiration, and he responds with a collection of art. I absolutely fell in love with the place, and I had this, like, sort of ambitious idea of use the town as a theater, as a, and as a huge studio. And he's not the only artist to do so. Cellist Ji Yo Kyung fills the air with her music, an unexpected venue for the beautiful notes of the classical instrument. And artist Tomas Araceno's works includes a beautiful scene of the mountains of Korea, even including peaks from North Korea, titled Degrees of Freedom. The binocular telescope captures a 360-degree view and the sentiments of many. These are just a few of the artists who are part of this year's Real DMZ project, a contemporary art project based on research conducted on the DMZ that brings a unique perspective of artists from all over the world. And this is uh, fascinating for me to try an exhibition that explores the field between politics and the art. It's a project that experiments with unique productions and exhibitions and aims to bring awareness to the real DMZ. Im Yoon Hee, Arirang News. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. 
Uh, we can expect mostly clear skies all across the nation today due to a high pressure front coming from China. However, rising temperatures have caused instability in the atmosphere, creating showers in the Gyeongsangbukdo and Cheolla the provinces. But most regions can expect a bright sunny day with temperatures ranging back in the mid-20s to the low 30s. And we also have a bit of a breeze creating fall-like weather conditions. And for those of you wondering about the weather over the upcoming Chuseok holiday, the daytime temperatures will stay mostly in the high 20s while things will turn out a bit chilly during the evening with partly cloudy skies. Now going over to our temperature readings. Seoul will be uh, reaching up to 28 this afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will be on the hot side as well, reaching up to 28 degrees. Now moving over to other regions, Jeju Island peaks to 27, Tokyo hits 26, while Mount Kungang hovers in the high 20s at 28 degrees. Now that's all for now. I'm Shaw Park and back to Yi Thank you, Michelle, for that. And that's the end of our newscast. Thank you for watching. I'll be back in about 90 minutes' time at 6 p.m. Korea time.